All right. Next up is our live showcase where we are kind of switch gears a little bit. We're very focused on growing our business, but we also understand at E4E how important it is that we live a good life along that way. And so it is my pleasure to bring up our next E4E partner, Dale Fertwingler. So Dale, take it away. I think you might be on mute, Dale. Trying to unmute, but I'm not seeing the... Uh, I gotcha. Got it. Okay, well, I've got my slides out of sync too, but uh, we'll go on anyway. Uh, you know, what we're gonna talk about today is trust, and trust affects all aspects of our life, and all of our relationships, so it's so essential. But today we're gonna to talk about how you can gain trust instantly. And one of the things we need to understand is that if we want someone to trust us, we have to show them that we understand. And that's what we're gonna be talking about today. And the key to that is to frame your messages in the context of their daily experiences. So to show you exactly what that looks like, I've created three examples here. The first one is an accounting example. I've taught accounting and finance for non-financial managers for roughly 18 years. And at the very early part of the program, I discussed the balance sheet, talking about the uh, Will's finance interests, uh, we talk about the balance sheet and uh, appropriately we would talk about assets, liabilities, and equity. And I knew that while most people would have some familiarity with the terms, they wouldn't understand them thoroughly enough to be able to categorize different accounts appropriately. So one of the things that helped was using an example that they experience in their everyday lives. So I would say to them, imagine for a moment that you're buying a home and the home costs $150,000. You put down 30,000 and you borrow 120 from the bank. So what's the asset, what's the liability, what's the equity? And they would get it right because they had familiarity with that. And in doing that, I gained their trust and the way that I know that I gained their trust is that later on in the program, when there was something they didn't understand, I didn't get objections like, well, that's not right. That can't be, that can't possibly work. Instead, I would get responses like, that doesn't make sense to me. I'm, I'm not understanding how that works. So they were taking the responsibility, they were embracing, if you will, the confusion rather than saying that they didn't trust me, which then opened the door for me to provide some clarification and help eliminate that confusion. But they never, in that 18 years, came back and, and challenged whether or not they thought I was saying something that was wrong. So that's one example. The next one is a little bit more complicated. In this particular situation, this was early in my years providing part-time CFO services. One of my clients called, she was a petite woman. At the time, her son was nine years old. He was big for his age and really sturdy. And he suffered ADHD and dyslexia. And the reason for her call, she said that they would spend three to four hours a night on his homework. And he would get so frustrated and angry that she was afraid that if the anger erupted, she would be hurt physically. And she said, I don't know what to do. So when I looked at this situation, I realized that ADHD and dyslexia were not gonna be the solutions because there was no shared experience. 
her son experienced it. She observed it. And I had no experience at all with it. So that wasn't going to be part of the solution. But the one thing that all three of us shared was the understanding of frustration. So my response to her was, I know what it's like when I get frustrated because I'm trying to do something that I'm ill-equipped to handle. And I also know that when I walk away from that frustration and let it subside, very quickly the solution to my problem surfaces, I can go back and finish. I said, so what I'm going to suggest to you is that you break the lesson plans into 15 minute increments. And at the end of the 15 minutes, ask your son a question that you're absolutely certain he can answer correctly. And then give him five minutes to play the drums because I knew the kid liked to play the drums. I said, then repeat the process. Now, she called me two weeks later and said, not only wasn't her son getting angry any longer, he was actually gaining confidence. But the real key here is the reason that she took my advice was because she had experienced frustration in the same way that you and I and everyone else does. And we all know that when we walk away from it, often what we need to know or what we're overlooking surfaces and we're able to move forward again. So it was the fact that uh, that shared experience that gave her the ability to trust in the recommendation that I made and use it and use it to good effect. Third exam, uh, example, I called it termination interruptus, but again, in my CFO work uh, early in my business, I would run into situations, rarely, but it would happen where an employee was not performing according to expectations. And despite repeated attempts to help them become more productive and meet expectations, it just wasn't happening. And the decision was made that the person's employment need to be terminated. And then I'd come back for the next visit with that client and find the person was still there. And when I'd ask why, I'd get all the usual excuses, which was an indication that they really just didn't want to have the conversation with that employee. And so I would say to them, well, let me ask you, um, do you think they know you're not happy with their performance? They call, oh, yeah, yeah. I said, do you think that they wake up every morning wondering whether or not today is going to be the day that I'm going to lose my job? They said, oh, yeah, probably. I said, do you really feel like it's fair? to allow somebody to live with that kind of fear and anxiety on a daily basis instead of having a 10 minute conversation with them. And typically they would take the action that day or the very next day, which was better for both. But again, what made that happen was the shared experience of being in situations of uncertainty and knowing what the fear and the anxiety felt like. That's why they were able to trust what I was saying and what I was suggesting there. So those are examples of how we can place things in the context of people's daily experiences. And one of the reasons that's so important is that because our minds are structured in a way that our memories are every bit as vivid as the original occurrence. So in each of these experiences, each of these situations, they could recall their own experience and the emotions associated with it. And the emotions, the memories are what trigger these emotions, the memory of the emotions. And those emotions, or what allow the person to validate your message. And with that validation comes trust. Because when they've experienced the same thing that you're talking about, they know what you're telling them is true, then there's no resistance there. But the story doesn't end there. Trust, when people trust you, 
they seek your counsel. And that affords you a tremendous amount of influence. They also invite you into their initiatives. And that provides opportunity. So that's a lot of benefit from the simple effort of framing your message in the context of their daily experiences. I'm open to questions. Dale, question from Bill. Once trust is broken, how can we regain it? Uh, it's difficult. Uh, it, it takes time. Um, but when, you, when you've lost their trust, then you have to find ways that uh, to get their permission to, get to, to trust you again. Um, one of the things that goes a long way is just admitting your mistake. Um, and, you know, not using an excuse, not trying to explain it away, just saying, yeah, I messed up. I really did. And I apologize. And what can I do to fix it? You know, what can I do to make this work? Um, let them know that you value the relationship and the last thing you want to do is is lose it but you realize that you you might have just done that so you know what can i do to solve this to re and regain your confidence lori says excellent job dale kara says admitting is good honesty own up uh, richard terry said could you give an example in a selling experience of uh, framing the things in, in the context of a personal experience. Um, yes. Yeah, let's say that, um, well, I had a client that had a morale problem. And so I said to them, you know, do you, have um, an absenteeism problem. I assume you have an absenteeism problem. And he said, oh yeah. I said, so how's the work getting done? You know, so you lead them through that thought process in which they're thinking about their own experience. And so he realized that he was spending money on overtime. He realized he was spending money um, in uh, temporary help. So it, it opened his mind to things that it was actually associated with a morale problem that he wasn't looking at. Does that help? Again, it, it brought him back to the things he was experiencing. Richard said, yes, thank you. Uh, Thad asked, after gaining the trust, is it important to continue building the trust? Yeah, it's, it's an ongoing process. Once you've gained trust, then the things that you do uh, are, have to be designed to retain that trust. Uh, I, I hesitated over the word building, uh, you know, because once you've gained somebody's trust to the point where they're seeking your counsel, and I'm not sure, <laughs> you know, how much farther it can go beyond that, but, uh, Certainly retaining it and sustaining it is an essential element. Uh, Les said, rather than implying that there's some wrong, something wrong with the person, one thing I propose for constructive accountability is ask what's getting in the way. Yes, yeah, one of the things that will kill any discussion uh, is, uh, ascribing blame, you know, so uh, you know, staying away from that and, and um, just asking a question as what Les suggested that gets them to rethink the position that they've got or what they're trying to accomplish. 
Kathy said, Dale, thank you for uh, such great information and examples. Good. And that's it. All right. Thanks, everybody.